I watched your broadcast earlier today about Facebook shops, and I thought to myself, there's a disturbance in the force here in a couple of ways. First, if I got it correctly, millions of small businesses, millions, just got offered a new, a number of new distribution channels direct to consumers. Am I right about that? Uh, yeah, that's basically right. We're, we're starting with about a million, but we'll be expanding it more over the next few months. And the basic thing that we're doing is giving small businesses uh, an easy way to create a shop on their profile on Facebook and Instagram, and um, then expanding it to, to our other apps, WhatsApp and, and Messenger, over the next few months. And it's, it's really easy to set up. Uh, you, you basically you, you set up a shop once, and then you'll have a consistent experience across all of our apps to be able to reach people uh, and hopefully uh, increase your, your sales, uh, which you know, is, is especially important to folks right now um, as we're going through this uh, pretty tough economic time and a lot of small businesses are struggling and trying to move online uh, to, to, to kind of get um, as, as much business as they can. So I, I, I personally pushed pretty hard to, to accelerate the development of this and get this out as quickly as possible. So I immediately brought it down to my scale. I, I, there are two kinds of small businesses in my life, those that advertise on this show like Solaire Grills and those in which I invest like Sea Bags. One's in Whittier, one's in Maine. Immediately I thought they both already have websites that they sell through, but this new suite of tools across all these different platforms doesn't cost them anything, right? They just can attach your new tools to them and immediately sell from their inventory and make their catalogs available. That's right. Setting up a shop is free, uh, and a, a big part of what we uh, are, are trying to do is, you know, a lot of businesses have uh, have mobile websites or websites, like you're saying. So a, a common experience that people have today is, you know, they see an ad for a product that looks interesting on Instagram, uh, or they'll see a business post about something that looks interesting on Facebook, and then they'll, they'll click on that, and it'll take them to a mobile website. Um, that can often be slow, um, inconsistent with the experience of the, the native app that they were just on on Facebook or Instagram. You know, often that website doesn't, it doesn't know what their credit card number is or their shipping address. They have to fumble around with their wallet in order to, to get that in. And you know, because of all that friction, a lot of people just end up abandoning the flow. And that ends up being a worse experience for consumers, and it ends up taking away sales from those businesses. My it's wife and I were watching now. you. We were watching you say that about fumbling around for your wallet and losing it and just giving up. And we said that's exactly right. So I gather once you log into the system, you're always going to be able to use this system in a seamless way. Whatever the Facebook app, WhatsApp, uh, uh, the Instagram, etc., it will all be across the suite of platforms. That's right. That's what we're trying to do. We've built a payment system that works across our, our family of different apps and. If you put in your credit card once in any of the apps, then you, that, that can be stored if you want it to be, and then uh, you, you can use that easily without having to re-enter it. And you know, it's, a, it's a pretty well-known secret in the e-commerce world that you know, the difference between having a credit card stored up front um, or not when you're going to make a transaction uh, can be as much as a 30% drop-off in the number of people who end up going through and buying the, buying the goods. So, um, you know, for, so, for small businesses now who are largely moving online in order to make up for all of the lost sales from their physical storefronts during this COVID period, um, you know, making it so that the, the experience can be as seamless as possible uh, for consumers makes it so that they, they can end up selling more things and hopefully staying afloat during this period. So I, so I immediately thought good news for Solaire, great news for Seabags. And I thought, boy, they're not going to be very happy at Amazon. Uh, did you did you play the game Risk when you were young, Mark? Uh, I I did. I, okay. I like the game Risk. Uh, you and you and lot. me both. And so I think of big tech as sort of like the continents, and and you're Europe, and Amazon's North America, and Google is Asia. And it seemed like today you may have launched an attack on North America. I I, I can't imagine Amazon's too happy about this. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the market is so big um, that I actually think it's more productive not to think about it as um, you know, a zero-sum game of trying to uh, take share from someone else. But just I, I find that the best things get built if you're just trying to 
do something unique in the world and, um, and help people out in a way that other people aren't. So you know, Amazon provides a great service. A lot of people love buying and selling through that. Um, but clearly, if you're a small business today, you're, um, you know, this is a tough economic period. You're looking for all of the different places that you can possibly sell through. So being able to set up a shop across Facebook and Instagram, eventually WhatsApp, um, you know, it's not like those businesses, they're not going to turn off their Amazon presence. They're not going to turn off their mobile website. They're going to want all of these channels. Um, but we, what we've just added is a new tool uh, to their arsenal. Um, and I think that this is especially important right now because, you know, a lot of physical storefronts aren't open for business right now, or at least are at a diminished capacity um, for, for the time being. So, um, you know, these online uh, shops, they're open for business right now. And I, I think that this is a particularly relevant time where, where a lot of these kinds of businesses are shifting online. Well, when I saw that pole vaulting into direct commerce and frictionless and at no cost, I thought to myself, that is, that's right back to risk and someone's going to have a counter move. We'll follow that. Now I want to turn to the virus if I can. Uh, I, I've been reading about the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and the mission statement says it will, quote, support the science and tech that will make it possible to cure, prevent, or manage all diseases by the end of the century. Did that initiative give you an early warning that this virus was different from every other virus we have seen in the last 25 years? Uh, certainly a little bit. Um, I wish it gave us more of a warning uh, further in advance. But, uh, you know, through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, you know, I get to work with some of the leading infectious disease scientists and, and doctors and public health folks. Um, around the world. So as this was starting to spread, you know, first in, in China and, and in Asia, um, but then starting to kind of leak out around the world, um, you know, it was some of those public health officials, including you know, folks like Tom Frieden, who is the former director of the, the CDC, um, you know, I was kind of getting notes from, from them saying, hey, uh, this looks like it's not going to be containable. Um, and you know, no matter what the, no matter what governments do, it looks like this really is going to spread everywhere and, and is going to affect every country in some way. Um, so I think that there was really a turning point around the end of February, where before that, uh, a lot of these folks thought that there was at least some chance that it might be able to be contained to, uh, you know, China, Korea, uh, Japan, you know, the, the, the countries in, in, in that in, in that area. But, uh, but towards the end of February, I think it became clear that it was, it was going to be everywhere. Um, and then uh, governments and, and all institutions really needed to prepare. And that's, uh, we were among the first companies to, to react quickly to that in terms of um, having our employees uh, move to working from home, which, you know, we're in a fortunate position where uh, a lot of them can productively do that because you can you know, write code from, from pretty much anywhere. Um, and I quickly pivoted a lot of the work inside the company um, and inside the, the foundation at, at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to work on things that, that would be especially important and helpful during this period. So now, helping out with the health response, uh, having taken the, connected to the people they care about. Yeah. Uh, having taken that deep dive into the, into the pandemic, are you personally an optimist uh, that we will have either a vaccine that is effective or therapeutics that are broadly applicable and effective by the end of the year? Gosh, I think, you know, I'm not, I personally am not a, the expert in these areas, so I'm a little wary to weigh in myself, but from everything that I've heard from folks, um, I, I don't think that we should expect a vaccine this year. Um, there, it, it sounds like there are a number of candidates for vaccines that are promising, but in order to go through the process of testing them and making sure that they're both safe and effective, um, you want the testing to go on for quite a while. Um, so that way you can make sure that there aren't any adverse effects that, that develop later. So you know, most folks to, who, I, who I've talked to um, think that you know, sometime in, towards the end of H1 next year in 2021 is uh, really the soonest that we should be expecting a vaccine. Um, and then of course, there's a lot of risk that it actually ends up taking longer. I and mean, you have to keep in mind that you know, to date, the fastest that we've ever gone from really um, seeing a new virus and working on a vaccine to getting the vaccine is Ebola, um, which was four years, right? So 
um, and that's that's recent. So, you know, we're talking here about even if we're ready by the end of H1 and 2021, that would be, you know, 18 months or a little less than 18 months, which would be just significantly faster than this has ever gone before. Um, so that that I think is going to be is going to be tough, and I, I think that there's probably a meaningful chance that it, it isn't even ready by by the the end of H1 uh, next year. All on right. The so now, side, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, go for it. No, I go ahead on the therapeutics because that's just as important in my book. Yeah, I, I agree. And you know, from from the experts who I've talked to on this, um, you know, there's there, there are a bunch of things that, um, I mean, basically the playbook here is you you take all of the drugs that have been cleared as safe uh, to use by, by the FDA previously. And you just test them to see um, if any of them might be effective um, against COVID. And there you have the benefit, um, unlike the vaccine development, where you know that these drugs are safe, or at least you, the side effects are well documented. So here you're just testing for effectiveness. And that's where you know, you've gotten things like remdesivir, which it's not that it's um, a complete game changer for, for treating this, uh, but it's it is a small step in the, in the right direction, and it gives um, some of these companies something that they can build on top of as a foundation. Um, you know, a lot, of, a, lo- a lot of the experts who I've talked to have kind of likened this to um, during the, the AIDS uh, epidemic um, in the early days, they, they, they kind of think that remdesivir was kind of, is, is sort of like an analogy to the first drug that seemed like it might be effective there. Um, and that's something that scientists then built on top of for a few years to come until they got to the cocktail that ends up being um, pretty effective. So I think that's kind of more the zone that we're in there on, on, the, on the therapeutics. But uh, we haven't run through every, every therapy yet. So there's, there's still hope that there's something else out there that we're not as aware of. So as the whole so world rallies. That, that the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative is, is funding and, and trying to do directly. All right. So there's there's a whole world that is attacking the virus, but there's also within the world an attack going on between the United States and the PRC. You, Mark Zuckerberg, are in a very unique position. You've spent time with both General Secretary Xi, I think, at dinner, and with President Trump. Uh, I'm correct, right? Both men? Yes. And so how are they alike and how are they different? Gosh, I mean, that's a... Uh... That's that's a tough question. I think I've spent I've spent some time with each of them, um, but probably not quite enough to really um, get into the get get into like the psychology of how each of them would process things. Um, I, I also think that important to understand the situations. It's not just um, you know the personalities or. Uh, um, it, it, or worldviews of the leaders, it's um, it's also just institutionally, you know, what is the political situation that they face, and what are the pressures that they're under, and it's just it's very different, right? And, and we have a democratic country um, where you know our president is much more accountable to the people. Um, I mean, we have elections. I think that that is obviously an incredibly important uh, dynamic that is not just important for preserving our political freedoms. But you know, when we talk about innovation and, and prosperity and opportunity for people, um, you know, all that flows downhill from from having freedom, I, I believe. Um, so, I mean, those are the things that, that I um, believe in most deeply about about our system. And I, I just think that the uh, the political situation in in, in China and, and other countries um, is often wired very differently in ways that um, can make it even harder for, for people coming from the U.S. to really understand how they would how they would approach a problem. Well, were either or both of them interested in what you have to say? Were they probing of you, or were you expected to ask them questions and receive their wisdom? I mean, it's, you know, I've talked to them in different contexts. So it's, um, and, and, and of course with, um, uh, with with she, there's there's also the language barrier. I mean, I speak Mandarin a little bit, um, but but I, I I would definitely not say that I'm fluent by by any means. Um, so it, it, I think it just depends more on on the the environment in which in which you talk to the folks. But um, but I mean, certainly, um, you know, when I when I've talked to uh, the president here, I mean, he's he's very curious about what we're what we're doing, what innovation we're seeing. Um, and, and, and a bunch of specific questions there. Um, I think the, the, the times, the few times that I've been in China and have, folk, and have talked to officials there, 
um, you know, they've been very curious too about American innovation because I, I think uh, you know they really uh, look up to the innovation, especially in the tech industry in the U.S. Um, you know that's an area where you know historically the reputation in, in China um, was that they were they were playing some catch up and, um, and and a lot of the companies there were kind of looking at at Western companies and you know there, there were concerns about intellectual property violations and, and, and theft and, and areas like that. Um, but I think they're very focused on trying to catch up. But you know, the tech industry in the U.S. is one of our most dynamic industries. I, I believe that it's a, a, um, a big strength of the country, that, um, that we're uh, really the global leaders in, in that. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm proud to, to play a part in that, but that's something that I believe deeply. And you know, one thing that I'd say, though, about you know, a lot of when, when you're talking about the geopolitics about the U.S. and China, one thing that I think doesn't get taken into account enough is that it's not just about what happens in those countries. A lot of the, the question that, that I'm focused on is what happens everywhere else, right? So Facebook, for example, you know, we just passed this milestone where now there are 3 billion people around the world um, who use one of our services um, actively every month. And you know, that's, that's obviously a lot more people than are in the U.S. So in the U.S., you know, that makes up um, at this point about a tenth um, of, of, our, of our global population that are using our products. But the fact that we're an American company uh, that cares deeply about things like free expression and democratic principles and empowering individuals, and that now you have you know, people across Europe using our products, across Latin America, across India, um, basically across almost every country in the world except we're not, we're not in China and we're not in North Korea. Those are, those are basically the two countries that we, um, that we, that we don't um, offer our products. But the fact that if you go to you know, an, an Indian citizen um, and a lot of how they're communicating um, is, is over American innovations. You know, maybe they're, they're using Facebook or WhatsApp. You know, maybe they have an iPhone or they have a, a phone with Google's Android operating system. And those are all designed and built with, um, with these democratic values. I, I do think that that is just an important cultural strength. Well, it is, um, but the, that, you, you mentioned that, that we should all both be proud of and should be looking to, to ex accentuate and, and preserve that strength. I'm proud of that, but Facebook is not allowed in China, but China is allowed on Facebook. And right now, China is running an I.O. against the United States, which is comprehensive. It, the disinformation campaign about the origin of the virus is as sophisticated as any I've ever seen. And I, I've been in this business for 35 years on the intelligence side for a while. Is Facebook taking a side in that effort of China to rewrite history on the virus? Are you actively trying to purge from your platform their disinformation? So we're doing a lot on misinformation in, in general here. And you know, I guess there's, there's really three categories of, of work that we do. One is you have these sophisticated uh, information operations like you're talking about that come from um, sophisticated governments. And you know, we've seen the most activity from Russia and Iran, um, but we, we have also seen, um, in, in some cases, some, some signal that there, that there are some coming from China as well. And there, you know, we, we really have gotten a lot more sophisticated at this since 2016. Our, um, our partnerships working with the intelligence community and um, the U.S. government and governments around the world have gotten just a lot deeper across the tech industry um, to the point where over the last three or four years, we've now identified about 50 of these sophisticated information operations coming from these different countries and have shut them down. And that's largely been about political interference, um, although I do think that with the pandemic around coronavirus, um, that is an environment that, that some nation states might look to exploit. So this is something that we're we're very aware of and are looking at very closely. What, what um, was the objective, Mark, that, of the what was the objective of the oversight board when it comes to content moderation? For example, if China is pushing disinformation on the origin of the virus, what is the objective of the oversight board with regards to that content? Does it get to them? Um. So the 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 oversight board is kind of going at a different a different vein of what we work on, um, but. Basically, what we've found is that people want an independent organization that they can appeal to if they think that we're getting something wrong on content, right? So if, 
you know, people obviously really care about having the ability to have a voice, and you know, I really care about that. That's a big part of why I created the company. I don't think you create a, a company like this that, that empowers individuals if you don't believe that individual voice is, is really important. Um, but then you get into all these very complex nuances, like, you know, no matter what you think about about free expression or giving people a voice, you, you obviously aren't going to want to support you know, terrorist content or um, child exploitation or um, some of these really terrible things. Um, and, and, you know, even U.S. tradition, which is the strongest free speech tradition in the world, you know, we have principles like you can't go into a movie theater and yell um, fire in the middle of a crowded theater because it could put people in imminent risk of physical harm. So the, all the debates then flow downstream from that to, well, what is the, how do you define what, um, what is harmful and what isn't? And how do you make it so that people can express as many possible things as, as they would like, um, but you just uh, try to cut down on the things that are truly going to be dangerous? And those are, they're, they're philosophical questions, they're political questions, they're going to be debated for um, forever. And frankly, I understand why a lot of people would be uncomfortable that a, a single private company um, would be making so many decisions about that. So we embarked on this process to create uh, a self-regulatory um, body, which we call the Oversight Board, and it's made of, to start, 20, uh, basically, people from, from all walks of life, um, former judges, um, former prime ministers, um, you know, people who have run uh, nonprofits, uh, academics, and they come from, from all different backgrounds. It's a very diverse group. But the one thing that they all have in common and that we vetted them all for is a very strong commitment to giving people a voice and free expression. Have, have you got a sense of how board, have you got a sense of how the conservative or the center right American political opinion makers have reacted to the oversight board yet? Um, a, a little. Uh, it's, I mean, I think this is it's a new thing. So I think that there's people have questions about how it's going to play out. I think uh, at this point, I, I think more people know where I stand on free expression. I mean, I gave this this speech um, in in Georgetown last year. I, I think at this point, I've made um, some some very hard uh, public decisions on on coming uh, down pretty strong on the side of giving people a voice in free expression. So I think people kind of understand where I am on this. And now we've We've established this new oversight board, and I think that there is, um, you know, people have questions across the political spectrum about how will this board influence the process? Um, is it going to be as strong on free expression as I am? Um, on the other side of the spectrum, I think a lot of people worry, is this really going to be inappropriate? Um, is this going to get to good outcomes? Because, because Mark and the team were so focused on appointing people who, who believe so strongly in free expression. So I think that there, there are questions about how this will play out, um, but the, the announcement of the Oversight Board was never meant to be the, the end of the process. I think this body will build its credibility over time by the rulings that it makes. When people appeal um, decisions to it, and, and it will rule over time, um, I imagine, uh, very thoughtfully and transparently, um, and, and I, I would imagine in, in a way that will uh, be very protective of people's free expression. Right. Um, the, mo the most piercing criticism I have heard is... I think it'll establish its reputation okay. that way. The, the, the most piercing criticism I've heard, and I'm not really much on content moderation, I, I'm much more libertarian than most, is that of the 20 members, 15 are not Americans. Of the five, only one is an originalist. I, I know Judge McConnell, but he'll get rolled by 19 people. And do we really want 15 foreigners moderating content about American political discourse? I, I, in other words... How in the world did we end up, it's almost like a new Coke moment. How did you, with your commitment at Georgetown and even on Monday at the European speech, how did you end up with a group that most sort of free speech absolutists like me say, oh my gosh, that's not a free speech group. That's a bureaucracy like the EU. Well, I think we're going to have to see how it, and, and I think it'll build its credibility over time through the decisions it makes. But, but look, I would encourage folks to uh, not oversimplify this to the point of saying that someone who isn't American can't care about free expression. I think that that um, is uh, well. That would be uh, stupid. That, 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 that would be stupid. But because yeah, but, but the American standard is the most rigorous in terms of allowing speech. As you said earlier, 
We are the most protective of speech in the world, and a lot of Europeans aren't. I mean, British label, libel laws are not particularly good. Before we run out of time, Mark, i got to ask you about politics. Uh, Joe Biden came after you personally, personally, in a December 16th sit-down with the New York Times editorial page, saying, I've never been a big Zuckerberg fan. I think he's a real problem. I was kind of shocked by this. Uh, he wants to revoke Section 230. He wants to make you civilly liable. Does that worry you that one of the two nominees for president doesn't like you personally? I, I mean, it's, um, someone did share those comments with me when I when I uh, when I, when I think he made those, and you know, obviously, you know, running an enterprise like this, that that isn't the type of thing that you want to see. Um, but look, I mean, overall. Um, I have a lot of faith, maybe maybe more than I should, but I, but I have a lot of faith in uh, American institutions and, and democracy overall. And um, I think to some degree you have to if you're if you're building uh, something whose mission is to give every person a voice, um, because you know these days there are a lot of people saying, hey, you shouldn't give everyone a voice, and you know, that's what democracy is all about: is that everyone should be able to. Um, should, should be able to vote the way they want, should be able to express their views, and that through that process, um, you get to a better outcome for, for everyone over time. Um, you know, I, I have confidence that, uh, you know, whichever way this goes, um, you know, there are, there, are, there are good institutions, um, there are a lot of good people who, who are coming at this with, with good faith, um, trying to solve problems that they think are, are, are real problems. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm still naive on this, but... Um, the late Charles Krauthammer used to say... I would rather say. live in, in our country under our system than, than anywhere else in the world, and I'm very proud of our of, of, of kind of the way that our, that our system works. I, I, I think you're the benefit of it, and I think you benefit us, but I do worry about the board, but I worry more about politics coming for big tech, and I've, I've argued for a big tech truce. I'm more concerned about national security than I am about antitrust issues. It looks like we might have a big tech truce. Have you talked with the government about allowing the cooperation between big tech during the pandemic that seems to be vitally necessary at this moment to collect, analyze, aggregate, and distribute necessary, necessary data? Well, you know, we always partner with, um, with the government on a number of things. I mean, you've talked about national security. We certainly partner on national security, and that's something that, you know, I know some companies have had issues around that, um, but you know, my view is, you know, we're an American company. I want, um, uh, like, I, I want to make sure our government does a great job on this. I, I want to find ways to, um, to, to make sure that we can, um, can, can help out with our national security. Um, so we're, we're generally partnering on, on a number of, um, of, of fronts like this. I think that that's separate from whatever you know the regulatory scrutiny is that we have. Um, you know, I think it's it, the scale that we're dealing with, I think you need to be able to both get scrutiny and get criticized for things, but also work with those same people on areas where you can find common ground. Um, I think that that's, that's just a, a, a very important uh, principle. L and let me close with... I think that that's what's happening now. Let, let me close with asking you about your newsfeed. Um, how does Mark Zuckerberg get his information? How much do you rely on your own feed in percentage terms for your inputs? Well, I use our products a lot, and I use a, a lot of the social products. I mean, I, I, I certainly, um, you know, use Facebook and Instagram every day, but I also have a number of WhatsApp groups and, um, and messenger groups with, with people who, who I care about, who are my friends, who I think are smart at different things, and they send me links for, for different things as well. But um, I'd say a lot of my, of, of my information flow probably comes through the products in those ways. Um, and it's curated uh, by, by the, you know, either the people I'm following on, on social networks or uh, through the groups of people who I think are smart through messaging apps. So the um, second part of that question is, uh, Fra Franklin Four is worried about world without mind, the, the algorithm controlling our information feed, the blue bubble, the red bubble. Are you worried about that, that people are just becoming encapsulated in their own echo chambers? Oh, I think you have to separate out a few things there. I mean, I personally don't think, I mean, I, it, I don't think we're living in a world where the algorithm is controlling what you see on Facebook. Um, you control what you see because you decide who your friends are and who you follow. 
You know, it's not like we have some system that's choosing what things could potentially go in your feed. You choose what could go in your feed based on who you, who you follow. All that the algorithm is doing is saying, okay, your friends and the people you follow shared you know, 400 things today. So let's put um, the picture of you know, your cousin just had a baby, and that's probably pretty important, and you're not going to want to miss that. Let's put that at the top. Um, and then a lot of your friends seem to be discussing this topic. There are a lot of um, comments or a lot of engagement on this, so and maybe we'll put that towards the top so that you can see that. But you know, I, I actually think in this case what, what the algorithm is doing is very basic con compared to the decisions that individuals are making. And you know, frankly, I find some of those criticisms to be, um, you know, I think to some degree, uh, you know, a little bit paternalistic. And I, I personally believe that people should be in the position to choose to share what they want um, and to choose who they want to associate with. That's an important part of, of American speech tradition and, and First Amendment as well, is, is association. And being able to join the groups that you want, um, being able to say, here are the people who I want to hear from and where I want to get my, my information and, and who I trust, um, that stuff is all being democratized by, uh, by social networks as well. And that's an effect that I'm quite proud of. Um, and I know a lot of people lament that. Um, and it's not that it's, it's you know, there, there are certainly issues that come from it, but, um, but I think by and large that will be looked back on as a, as a positive element of this, not a negative one. On that note, a very strong agreement because I appreciated your Georgetown speech. I thought it was in the right direction. And uh, I, I just think it's a, an amazing time for speech. I hope government does not destroy the ability to make it stronger. Good luck with this oversight board, Mark Zuckerberg. I, I think it's a swing and a miss, but you know, you don't try. You never know until you try, right? And I appreciate your time this afternoon. All right. Thank you, Hugh. Thank you, Mark. Okay, they're clear.